Hello and a very warm welcome to Canterbury Cathedral. At the end of my video series on Julian of Norwich, I asked you to send in to me either a video or an email or even a letter just to tell me about what Julian means to you. I'm delighted to say that a number of you did do that and we are now able to present the People's Julian video to you. So our first email comes from Alina, Alina Callen, who is actually in Romania. And she wrote to me to ask me if I could recommend a new modern translation of the Revelations of Divine Love to her because she wanted to be able to translate the text into Romanian. This is also what she wrote about how much Julian means to her. I have visited Norwich about eight years ago and heard about Julian then, but perhaps I did not read anything or was not in a context to understand or be touched by it, so that was it. I find Julian is a beautiful treasure, even more beautiful because she writes about a very kind love, very rarely found in church texts and even more. It's in 14th century. I feel the typical feminine language towards tenderness and hope and space for compassion and for all to be well and gentleness, all so descriptive of what I am looking for in my search for God, a father and a mother. Very far away from some people always talking about rules and rosaries and hell and not bringing any healing or point. There aren't many writers like her. I like this gentleness of saying things for love of them, no pressure of having to digest a theological complication and get it right. No, it's not about teaching so much as it is about transmitting an experience. A bit of life with it, strength and comfort, rather than rational knowledge. I am no expert in English or languages or theology, but I am passionate about this. And I like reading, and I believe I can do a fair job in bringing this to others who would benefit from it. I want to work on translating the revelations into Romanian, first of all so I can understand them better, and second so others like me can read them. Hopefully this will get into the hands of theologians, linguists, and they will continue it and improve it. Thank you very much Alina for your email and I do hope you go, you go well with your translation of the Revelations. The next email is from William Hill and in it he speaks about how the series reawakened his interest in Julian and taking her words into his daily practice of prayer. He writes, My wife Elizabeth and I have had connections with Norwich and Norfolk since 1977. Elizabeth was confirmed in Sprouston Church on the outskirts of Norwich in 1980 and our vicar Henry Stapleton gave her a copy of a small book enfolded in love, daily readings with Julian of Norwich. I was a more reluctant Christian and so wasn't baptised and confirmed until 1988, this time in Farnham. Once more Henry gave me a copy of Enfolded in Love. Both copies still look as good as new. However, at some time in the 1980s, I visited the Julian Shrine and found a copy of the Penguin Classic, Julian of Norwich, Revelations of Divine Love. I read this, but it left little impression on my doubting faith. Other books in the 1990s seemed to emphasise aspects of Julian talking of the motherhood of God. 
I joined a Julian group in the early 1990s, which was not a good idea. Even when much younger, I could lose concentration and go to sleep in the silences. Julian was lost to me and became rather ethereal. My career has been in railway, civic engineering, civil engineering, where life was about real things, earth, water, storms, drought, and real people. So you have reawakened my interest in Julian by making her a real person, living in a real place, in a real time, which knew plagues. However, I have decided not to read Revelations, but I am including in my daily morning prayer a page of the small booklet that we have had unloved since 1980, Enfolded in Love. Thank you very much for writing in, William. We have people contact us from all over the world and it's um, a real delight to be able to share with you that um, throughout the series a group of five spiritual directors from the Spiritual Directors Network in Christchurch, New Zealand met via Zoom every week to discuss the talks and they have sent me a wonderful resume of their thoughts but I just wanted to give you a picture of them so that you can delight in the spiritual direction that they give others and how much they've got from reading Julian and learning more about them. And now we come to someone in Perth, Jill Garrett, who sent me a lovely card of Julian. But along with it, she sent me this wonderful booklet called Walking with Julian. And in it, it records a number of reflections and <clears throat> a number of reflections about how people have been moved by Julian so much that they've actually entered into um, the companions of Julian of Norwich. This is a group of people who draw inspiration from Julian's revelations for their daily lives and try to reflect her message of God's love for all people. Unfortunately, I'm unable to read out all of them to you, but it's a very stirring book and shows just how much reading the revelations of divine love have enabled people to walk deeper and closer with God in their lives and to share that love with others throughout the world. And now we're going to move to a video and the first part of Julian Sankey's video on, um, on his reflections on divine love and I'm really grateful that he sent this to us and this first part we're going to hear about is how much the writings of Julian have helped him during this period of lockdown. My own lockdown over these past weeks has given me space to to do that along with many other things that I've wanted to do in the past. And the thing that has been central to me is that I have been gripped just as Julian was with that sense that I am loved by God totally and unconditionally and for me the words that came to me were you are my beloved child I take great delight in you now I'd never really thought of things in that those terms and then when I turned recently to reread Julian I got really excited as I came to the ninth and tenth chapters of the revelations that she explored the idea that God takes great delight in us as children and that was really exciting you know when she explains that the Holy Trinity takes delight in all that Jesus underwent for our salvation and to achieve that salvation and so she hears Jesus saying to her 
my delight is in your holiness, in your endless joy and happiness with me. And her response was, such is my understanding, as simply as I can put it, of his blessed words, see how I loved you. Our Lord showed this to make us glad and cheerful. Thank you very much to Julian for his wonderful insight into the love that God has for all of us and which is shown so beautifully in Julian's writings. I now move to another email and this has been sent in to us by Linda Cross who is a local ordained minister just down the road from here in the Y Benefice. She writes, I have had a love of the natural world all my life and have been influenced by Celtic spirituality, in particular Iona and John Philip Newell. He often quite quotes George MacLeod, matters, matters in his writing. I guess that Julian was very familiar with hazelnuts. Hazel trees were important in everyday medieval life, nuts for humans to eat, leaves for animals to browse on, and stems for weaving baskets. It is marvellous that something so small as a hazelnut can support the life of a community. They are integral to the life of the whole woodland ecosystems. Dormice, squirrels and many other species of fauna and flora find a favourable habitat here in the ancient hazel woodlands around us. Having a basic understanding of ecology, I can appreciate Julian's words that all that is made is to be found in a hazelnut and that God made it, loves it and keeps it. Maybe one of the benefits of lockdown for me has been time to appreciate the natural world in greater detail and realise that every living thing manifests God's glory and has its role in sustaining the whole. Thank you, Linda, for sending that through to us and for helping us once again to look around and enjoy the natural world around us, which Julian also helps us to do. We now move to um, Charles Sell, who is one of the volunteers here at the Cathedral, and he has written this for us. The subject of Julian holding a hazelnut in her hand and thinking of it as the universe brought a childhood experience to my mind. I can't remember my age at the time, but I must have been quite young, possibly preschool. I was lying in bed in a state somewhere between waking and sleeping. In my hand was a small object, possibly a marble. As I concentrated on it, I felt that at times it was tiny and at other times huge. It seemed that my mind could make this object any size I wished. It was a weird experience and have not been able to repeat it since. Putting this together with Julian's thoughts leads me to some of my ideas on cosmology. All our information about the universe comes through our senses and we use that input to create a mental mo model of the universe. Nowadays we are overawed by the size of the universe because of our ability to use telescopes to peer into vast distances. What we will never be able to do is to build a mental mo model of what exists outside the universe. I think that the success of our scientific efforts tends to limit us to seeing the universe as everything that nothing exists beyond it. Other experience I have had lead me to believe that Julian's vision is similar to mine. That is, that there is a greater reality outside, around and through the universe. The input from our physical senses cannot reach that greater reality. It can only be sensed by taking the step of faith. 
Thank you so much, Charles, for sharing your childhood experience with us and for speaking so beautifully on the words of faith and of that greater reality. We come now uh, to Peter, Peter Toon's email. He is a reader down at St Stephen's Church in Canterbury and he very kindly wrote to me and let me know about another anchoress who is just down the road, someone I never knew anything about. So it's been a delight for me to hear about some local history. And he writes this. I've long been a fan of St Julian, particularly her image of the hazelnut and the all shall be well quotation used by Eliot at the end of the four quartets. More recently, I've become interested in the Anchorite tradition more widely, having learnt about Lady Loretta, the recluse of Hackington, who lived for over 40 years as an anchoress at St Stephen's Church, where I am now a reader. For many years, she was almost forgotten, but we've started to commemorate the day of her death, the 4th of March, with a talk about her or some aspect of her period and medieval spirituality. And next year, which will be the 800th anniversary of her enclosure in 1221, we plan to have, mainly online, a symposium on medieval spirituality and the modern world. Well, thanks for sending that in, Peter, and do look out for that symposium and this time next year. So we now turn back to Julian and the final part of his video that I want to share with you, which speaks about how do we understand the role of the church and how Julian wrestled with her revelation and also with church doctrine. When you were discussing chapter five, you talked about the way that Julian, as it were, pushed the boundaries of her theology. You know, you talked about the apophatic, um, and yet she never lost her connection with what I might call an orthodox faith, with the faith of the church, which she was brought up in, which obviously the practice of which was her life as an anchoress and which up upheld her. Um, and I felt a deep affinity with her in that because I feel that I have pushed the boundaries of, of faith and that I've had to be held. And certainly my sense of being a part of the church has been a part of that. But I particularly was drawn to... Um, the long section from chapter 44, and to me it sounded as though she was stepping back from what had been revealed to her to address some of the hard questions that it had raised for her and asking for help and for understanding and revelation to um, engage with these. You know, I can almost hear her wrestling with these issues and trying to say how could she square that inner revelation with the truths that she had been taught. Um, and I found that a great encouragement when I'm worried by you know, the fact that I seem to be at odds with, with other Christians. And when you were discussing the, that same chapter, you talked about the use of penitential language and of the medieval practice of contrition. And it made me ask the question of how should that be a part of my, my life, my spirituality, where, you know, we have a very different way of looking at it perhaps from than the medievals did and when I come from a part of the church that has not had a tradition of sacramental confession um, 
So that's one of the things that I shall take away from the series to explore further. Now, I started with a personal question, and I think that I can say that in beginning to explore Julian, I have found something that is of value to me. You know, I have a, a sense that she was someone else who had a passion to know the reality of God, the Holy Trinity, as he'd been revealed principally in Christ and as he continues to enfold us by the Holy Spirit. So, you know, I've taken great encouragement from that. But I wondered if I might finish with a prayer which has become special to me. It was written by a former Bishop of Norwich, Peter Knott, but inspired by and echoing words of Mother Julian. O Lord God, from whom we come, from whom we are enfolded, to whom we shall return, bless us in our pilgrimage through life, with the power of the Father protecting, with the love of Jesus indwelling, and the light of the Spirit guiding, until we come to our ending in life and love eternal. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of our People's Julian video, and I just want to thank all those contributors to it, and also to say thank you for all, to all of you who have written in and said such kind words about the Julian series. I'm sorry if your piece didn't appear on this video, but thank you very much for being in contact with us any, anyway. I just want to end by saying I hope you all are blessed by reading Julian of Norwich and that you come to know God deeper. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>